So this course, specifically vegetable gardening, and you'll have to excuse me, I had a little bit technical difficulty, so I'm going to be clicking and advancing the old school way on the computer. So you have to excuse me on that one because I'll be, uh, that's our newest logo, Water University. Um, we have been rebranded. We used to be the Urban Water Team. Uh, we're very excited to be Water University now. We have over 20 different programs that we offer to you. This is not the only one. Uh, like you've heard in my introduction, irrigation classes, rainwater classes, landscape classes, there's only over 20 classes open to the general public. And that doesn't even include the professional classes. We teach all over the state of Texas, um, and more locally, North Texas, because we want to focus on our home area, uh, but we do travel all over the state of Texas. Did everybody receive this handout? Pick one up in the back. All right. This has got a lot of great information, including a lot of it that I'll be speaking on. Uh, my colleague Daniel Cunningham is actually on the cover. Um, we are a, a very good mix of professions. We jokingly call him the granola one of the group. Um, he loves his edible plants and things. He teaches some great courses on edible foraging um, and uh, composting and things like that. Uh, I focus a lot on the design plant selection as well uh, because that's what I did. Um, so I'm very excited to talk about this um, when we come to the edible landscape. Do you mind if we turn the light down no. so my screen is Not a little darker? There we go. Okay, so when we talk about the edible landscape, we are talking and we talk about vegetable gardening in particular. Uh, one of the things that we want people to sometimes do is think outside the raised planter box. A lot of people struggle with finding a space that they can fit the vegetables in or do what they see everybody else do or they feel they have to have you know, the rectangular vegetable garden. We want you to think outside that. All right? The edible landscape is something you can incorporate plants into your landscape, your existing ornamental landscape, to be aesthetic but also functional for you. And if you are, don't, aren't understanding what I'm saying, think of peppers. Who here has ever grown, you know, banana, banana peppers we talked about a minute ago, bell peppers? They're beautiful when they hang on the plant, aren't they? What about eggplants? Has anybody ever grown an eggplant? Yeah, people don't typically see that. It's almost like a showstopper. Somebody's walking up to your front door and they're like, oh my gosh, you know? And they're like, I buy that in the grocery store. How many people here are already vegetable garden? Right, there's always a handful of people. How many people are wanting to get started? Great. I love the beginners because when you grow that first plant or you're eating that first tomato or something like that, the excitement that you'll get that you grew that yourself and you didn't have to pay a grocery store for it and you controlled what chemicals and everything went on it is a great feeling. All right. So I'm excited that y'all are here. And like I said, urban foraging, we're starting even with the younger people. Um, and you will be amazed at what you're actually going to be able to harvest. Everybody is always amazed once they get their first crop. And so as we go through this and your excitement builds for vegetable garden, I want you to rein that in a little bit. And what I mean by that is we have people like, oh, I love okra. I'm going to grow lots of okra. <laughs> That's great. Grow as much okra as you want to or squash. I want to grow a lot of squash. They come to the vegetable garden and they get so excited and they do 10 squash plants for their family of three. Yep. Next thing we know, they're knocking on door. You want some squash? <laughs> You're going to be amazed at how much you can actually produce. All right, so don't go overboard. If you've ever grown an okra plant, you know what I'm talking about. You'll have okra coming out your ears. All right, so, but rein that excitement in a little bit. I want you to be realistic with this also. The challenges that we face in Texas, the number one is the extreme summers. You are preparing your vegetable garden and planning now for spring and summer, right? But we have to be realistic about a lot of our elements. We don't know, everybody always says, well, when are we, when are we gonna get our last freeze? I don't know, I'm not mother nature, I can't tell you. I can tell you that our last average freeze date is March 15th, and our last potential freeze date is April 15th. So that doesn't really help you between now and then, does it? Because a lot of your vegetables that you're wanting to do for spring and summer, you've got to start now. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're going to grow things like tomatoes and peppers from seed, you've got to start those now. If you're going to do transplants, you still have a little bit of time. When I say seed and transplant, do you understand what I mean? Okay. 
Growing vegetables from a seed. I don't need to explain that one, do I? <laughs> transplants are you buying the actual little plants and planting the plant. Those little plants are called transplants. So that's what I mean by that. All right, I want to make sure you understand all the terminology. Now, the planning, when we go into the vegetable garden, there's different steps in planning that we really need to look at. Oh, we need to look into. First of it is location. Do you have an idea of a good location now? If you don't think, who, does, who here struggles with, you don't know if you have a good location right now? Is it because of size and lighting? Well, sunlight, yeah. It's one of the struggles of sunlight. And that's where sometimes you don't have that sunlight and you have to think within the entire landscape. Maybe I need to incorporate this plant in my landscape over here because I get full sun. But I only get part sun over here, so maybe I can get away with some of my greens. All right? And, and I will tell you, I grow a ton of greens. I love everything from mustard greens to spinach to all those things. And those are really good for part shade situations. So if you, if you struggle with that. Size. Again, this is where you have to be realistic. All right, we have people that will try to turn their entire backyard into a vegetable garden. All right? One gentleman turned it into a business. He had 4,000 square feet in his backyard, which is a pretty good sized backyard. He turned the whole thing into vegetable production. It turned into such a good job for him. He went full time running an urban farm out of his backyard, producing. 8,000 pounds of produce a year. So, do you have time for that full-time job? <laughs> Sometimes a four by eight vegetable garden is enough for a family of five. All right, you have to look at the harvest of those plants. And those of y'all who vegetable garden know what I'm talking about, right? The amount of produce you can actually get. Water, what water are you going to use? How are you going to deliver the water to that garden? So you've got to think about that and process that as well. They have a couple extra chairs in the back too if y'all need that here. Soil. Soil preparation is key. The one thing we have to remember is a lot of the vet fruits and vegetables we want to grow in our landscapes are not native or adaptive to our area. They actually require a lot of care. So you will need to fertilize, whether you're organic or synthetic, and you will need to water. But how can we do that sustainably? And then vegetables. Everybody says, well, I don't know what to grow. <laughs> when you go to the store, what do you buy and what do you like to eat? Only you can answer that question. You may want something very complicated to grow. <laughs> you may want something very simple to grow. How many people want to grow tomatoes? It's usually 50 to 60% of the general public wants to grow tomatoes. It's a staple, isn't it? So maybe you should consider that. Now, when you're choosing your location, obviously we have to look at the sunlight, the water, everything we just talked about. But accessibility is key as well. I had one person that came to vegetable gardening got super excited. And that's why I keep emphasizing the rain yourself in. And they had that side of their house, like a lot of y'all may have, that's about 8 to 10 feet wide. Um, they had a chain link fence, so they actually got considerable amount of sun. But they took up the whole side of their house to do their vegetable garden. And where they entered to that side of their house, they laid out all their plants, everything was going well, until their corn started growing. <laughs> and they planted their corn where they would get to the rest. They created a wall. Accessibility. You have to get to those plants. If you're going to do a raised planter and you don't want to step into the garden, you have to design it and plant it within reach. So sizing is important when we, when we talk about all of that. Look at the sunlight at different times of the year. A lot of people don't always, you know how our days get shorter during the winter? That's not because we're changing our clocks. It's because of the way the sun hits the planet Earth. <laughs> all right, so we have to go back to kind of an elementary type thing in the shift of the Earth. During the winter, our sun is at its lowest. For those of y'all, and I was actually thinking about this coming here tonight when I talk about the sun. For those of us driving home, during that peak time of driving home, have you noticed the sun is more in your eyes now than it is during the summer? That's because our sun is lower, and it's setting faster right now too. 
and then go into spring and fall. It's kind of in between. And then summer is when it's at its highest. That's when it's the hottest. That's when our days are the longest because it's going full the full um, uh, arch of our sky, if you want to think of it like that. So when we're measuring sunlight, if you're planting a spring garden, you really have to pay attention to how much sunlight that area gets. You can't always measure it based off of winter and summer hours. Because during the summer, it could get 10 hours of sunlight. But during the spring and fall, it may only be six. During the winter, it could only be four. It's changing. Don't necessarily think of the hottest side of your house like it's during summertime. Does that make sense? Okay. Think of it like that. And then, of course, you have to look at shadowing effect. Think about that sunlight and think about that side of your house. My house sits faces due west. So I get the hot sun facing my house, but I have two huge 40-year-old oaks in my front yard. So my house stays shaded. I get quite a bit of sun during the winter, but it's shaded during the summer. So my fall vegetables, I was actually able to make ornamentals out of Swiss chard and things like that in my front yard because I got enough sun. But during the summertime, I'm full shade, meaning I don't get any direct sunlight in my front yard. So that's how things shift and move around my house. So I would be able to do summer planting um, in my front yard. So, are you gonna plant in the ground? Are you gonna do a raised planter? Are you gonna do a container garden? The wheels have gotta start turning. Are they already turning? Who here is going to plant in the ground? Actually create a road out vegetable garden. All right. You have more soil prep than the people doing a raised garden or a container garden. Because what kind of soil do we have here in Texas? I call it poor, right? And we have to remember that those tender vegetables, the transplants, the seedlings that you're going to be planting, that clay soil can suffocate them. They're very tender. So we have to do a lot of prep to our soil. And it's needed our clay soil. But can you grow vegetables in our soil? Yes. Absolutely. We just have to provide a little bit more care. Now, raised beds, like I said, those are becoming extremely popular. Um, all different ways of doing it. I'm always impressed when I get online and I find how people are building. There, I mean, there are some craftsmen out there. Is anybody on Pinterest? It's an addiction, is it not? Yes. Have you actually looked through all of your likes? If you go back and look at your likes from a year ago, you're like, why did I like that? You know? But these, I, I chose all of these off of that social media type so you can see all the different options out there. So if you're doing a raised planter, wood is a very popular way. If you open up your handouts that I provided you, there's other materials as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be wood. A lot of people are going to stone, natural stone, uh, or even like the paved stone products. Um, something, a lot of people don't like the wood. Wood, over time, can deteriorate. It can be a maintenance issue. Metal is becoming very popular nowadays. People are welding metal and creating things out of metal. And I'm, We were just down in Austin um, uh, last week uh, receiving an award with the Texas Water Development Board. And if any of y'all have been to the a or the AT&T Conference Center down there um, at that other school, UT, uh, they have some beautiful welded uh, beds, arches, that actually was done, I didn't realize, by a friend of mine who's an architect down there, Ann Coleman. So it doesn't have to be that way, but you know, you can go really bulky. You see how they just overlay those? You can create a little seat around there. One of the things that we're doing, and uh, Daniel and I are working on a program to teach at some of our the senior centers and retirement home uh, villages, are people who are doing their own gardenings. They have little patios or a community garden. And we're doing raised planters that are about as tall as your table. Because a lot of them aren't able to get on their knees anymore or bend over. But the th funny part about it is, I also call myself the lazy landscaper or gardener. I look for the easy way of doing things. I want that. <laughs> so, because you are going to have to uh, actually be involved. One of the things that I will say nine times out of ten, when people fail, whether it be landscaping, vegetable gardening, whatever it may be, nine times out of ten it's because they weren't present. If you're going to do this and you're going to commit to doing this and invest, whether it be in raised planters or soil prep for the soil, you have to be present. It is a daily checkup 
It is a daily commitment to check for moisture in the soil, things of that nature. Now, does that mean that it's a horrible thing that you have to go out there every single day? Hopefully not. Hopefully you'll realize that old saying of gardening as therapy. And especially when we get into April, April 15th one being one of the highly recommended planting dates, April 15th is also what? Tax day. So you either have money to burn or you need plant therapy, right? <laughs> so I just wanted to show you all the different ways. I mean, I just have some pictures of some raised planters. You can see there how they did cinder blocks. Cinder blocks are becoming very popular because they're inexpensive. But one of the things I like, this is actually the community garden. Uh, we also did one similar in another school, is the openings in the center blocks become planters as well. And what we did at the school garden is the openings in the center blocks is where we put the herbs. Oh. At the, another school garden, that's where they put their pollinators, you know, so that they could attract the pollinators. So all different ways to do it. Labyrinth styles are becoming uh, very popular nowadays. Um, in fact, there's a community garden in Dallas um, done by Native Americans, <clears throat> and they have a labyrinth as kind of a meditation garden, but it's also going to be an edible garden. And in this one, they're mixing ornamental as well as um, edible. What I mean by that is they're incorporating ornamental plants that are also edible. Or they're doing things like our potatoes and stuff that are vining that you eat beautiful. Has anybody actually grown not the ornamental sweet potato vine, but an actual sweet potato vine? or a sweet potato or a potato. They can be beautiful vining plants or vining climbing beans. They all can be beautiful. So appreciate the plants themselves because they can be attractive and colorful. They can add a whole new element to your landscape. Even the uh, structures that you put in there for things to climb on, get creative with this. Get classy with it. Look at that outdoor eating area right next to their herb vegetable area. You know, in uh, Pinterest, again, um, the, I've seen the tables where the middle of the table is where they have uh, the herbs and things like that going all the way down there. I'm a huge thyme fan. I love creeping thyme, and I use it in my landscape between steps and stones, also for the aromatherapy of it. Because when you step on it and you get that aroma, um, it's very good. Oregano has got huge health benefits and the aroma of it as well. Uh, all of those are hardy. So planting a lot of those herbs are dependable. They either die back and come back or they're evergreen. So don't, don't exclude the herbs in your thought and design process. There we have a lot of edibles mixed with our native adapters. So what we have here is, this is thyme, and then that is an artichoke, and then we've got Swiss chard in the back. Anybody like Swiss chard? <laughs> there's, a, a bright, there's a Swiss chard called Bright Lights. And it puts on all the bright stalks, yellows and reds, and it's really attractive. That's what I had in my front yard. Okay, so no matter what you're looking to do or achieve, there's a way for you to do it. Even if it's a patio situation, maybe you don't have a big backyard. Container gardening is actually very sustainable because you actually can see the water and how much water you're putting on that container, if it's passing through that container, you can control your watering better, which is more sustainable. You're controlling that microenvironment, the soil for that plant also. So a lot of people, it's a little bit easier to control than putting it into the soil. So there's a way for everybody to do this. But again, like I said, you need to make sure you can reach it. You can harvest and get to it. Ideally, you really don't want to walk amongst the plants on a vegetable garden if you do an actual designated vegetable garden. Remember how tender I said those plants are? You can compact a root. Anybody ever been up to the redwoods in Northern California? Even for those giants, we have to be concerned with compaction of their roots. The same thing with the, um, the drive through tree that just fell. It was compaction of the roots. So think of it like that. You don't want to compact it. If you do this, so what we're doing is, and this is a lot larger than what most people will do. It's just an example. We can walk and we can reach through, but we're not really walking into the garden. That's what that double reach, that reach means. Make sense? Protect your plants. Take pride in them and protect them. Now soil, amending your soil, like I said, is one of the most important keys in vegetable garden. 
Because of our clay soil, if you're doing in-ground vegetable gardening, this is extremely important. If you're doing the raised planter, you need to look at what mix you're going to put in that raised planter. I will forewarn you to be cautious of bagged soils, even if it says garden soil. You know, nowadays, I think, I don't remember what year it was, they are now required to put ingredients on all bagged goods. Has anybody ever turned over their soils or mulches and read the ingredients on that bag? Do it. Flip it over. Look at your, the back of your mulch and stuff, and it will tell you everything that's in there. And the number one ingredient that most of our garden soils have is peat moss. All right? Peat moss helps with acidity. It drops the pH in our soil. But we're also depleting our peat bogs. Yes, that is a natural thing we remove from bogs for us to put in those potting soils and those garden soils. So be cautious. My favorite thing to put in there is compost. Does anybody compost themselves? All right. Have you been to a compost program where they help you and teach you how to do it? All right. We have a great new publication and a great composting class. If you're going to vegetable garden, this is how I put it, to, I explain to people. What comes out of the ground can go back into the ground, right? So if you're harvesting your vegetables, are you going to cut that head of lettuce and cut the stem off and then throw it in the trash? What could you do with it? Compost it and keep using it, right? Even if you're buying those vegetables and those things from the store. I compost a lot. My colleagues make fun of me. But when you, and we'll go through some compostable material, uh, when you realize what you compost, you can compost within your home. Well, I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I get excited because I feel less I feel less wasteful when I compost and I recycle. You know, I throw away maybe one bag of trash a week into my trash can for them to pick up. My recycling bin is typically overflowing, and the compost bin is overflowing, and that makes me feel good. That makes me feel good. I'm having less of an impact on that. Testing your soil. Whether it's your mix or you want to test your native soil. Has anybody ever tested their soil before? Yeah. I just did this last December. Okay. I sent it to, you know, the guys. The college station? Yes, I did. Do you remember your results? Yes. No nitrogen. You were good. No, you... I didn't have any. I'm <laughs> But everything else was, let me ask you this. Everything else was fine or in the critical red level? Yes. Potassium and salt? So what happens is in our clay soil, when you test your soil, and well, let me explain it to you. I have some up here if you want to take some with you. What it is is this little bag that looks like a little vomit bag on an airplane. <laughs> you fill it up, and it tells you how to uh, collect all the soil. And I have the paper up here that has the instructions on the back, like you see right here. This is the form you fill out. And on the back, it's got the instructions. It was easy to do, wasn't it? Yeah, you fill this up to the line. You mail this off to College Station, and there's a college student just dying to test your soil on the other side. <laughs> and within about seven to ten days, they send it back to you with the form and tell you what they found. And in our clay soil, majority of the time, people come back that they don't need anything except for nitrogen. They'll typically be in the red or critical level, <clears throat> phosphorus and potassium and salt. Where do you think we get a lot of that from? Water and fertilizer. Those three numbers on a fertilizer bag is nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And most of our fertilizers are high in salt, sodium. And also our tap water can be high in lime, calcium, and sodium. You know the white crusty stuff you get on shower heads and pots from our tap water? So why would you go get fertilizers that have more of that in it? to put on your landscape or your vegetable garden if you don't need any more. You see the benefit of that? Soil test is $10, right? I did the soil test on my new yard, and I needed nitrogen is all I needed. So I went and bought a 50-pound bag of 2100 at a feed store. Do you know how much that cost me? $10. How much do you spend on fertilizer? I got you beat, I guess, with that 20 bucks, right? And then in my vegetable garden, I really try to stick, stick as much organic as I possibly can. Because one of the things that, and I'll, I have a slide on this, you have to remember is what you're putting on 
that plant is also what you're digesting. I'm not here to promote organic or synthetic, okay? In our organization, we stay neutral. So I'm not gonna get into the GMO conversation and all that, right? To each their own. What we want you to do is be more efficient and sustainable when you're doing it. Don't pump a lot of uh, chemicals or products on there just because you saw that commercial. In all of my programs, I say over and over and over again, if any of y'all been to my programs, we are marketed very well, right? We are marketed very well as to what fertilizer to buy, what soil to buy, what car to buy, what fast food to buy. When time, what time of year do you typically see your first fertilizer commercial? I've already seen my first fertilizer commercial. Do you want to fertilize right now? No. Why would you do that when we have more potential for freezes? You're encouraging a plant to grow when it could be damaged from a freeze. You have to be a better educated consumer. Start thinking for yourself. When you start gardening and experiencing this and becoming successful at this, which I have faith in all of y'all to do this, whether it's in a pot or in a vegetable garden, you're going to start thinking for yourself and be a better educated consumer. And remember, what you put out there, you're also consuming. So the nutrients that we typically need the most of in a vegetable garden is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. You already know that phosphorus and potassium you might already be high in. And you can, if you're organic, there's other products like blood meal, bone meals, things like that you can get all this from. There are organic complex fertilizers you can put out there. Oh, yeah, sure. You can take that one. Oh, the soil test. There you go. So all the rest are what we call our micro. Yes, plants need oxygen to their roots, all that sort of stuff. These are the micronutrients. These are the smaller things that they need, which we actually get quite a bit from composting. Our compost has a lot of our micronutrients. They don't always have our macronutrients. That's why we have to fertilize for macro. But if you compost, you'll get a lot of those micronutrients. Now, when we talk about composting, this is where I get excited. And my colleague Daniel is actually teaching a composting class tonight. I thought I was a nerd about composting. You should hear Daniel talk about composting. I wasn't joking when I said he's really good at I hope he watches this video. <laughs> the best thing about compo the adding compost to your vegetable garden is improving the quality and nutrition availability to your plants. Think of improving that clay soil and putting a lush soil in there that you can actually dig the hole with your hands. And the number one a uh, sustainable part of the composting is the nutrients it provides and the water it holds. Compost holds moisture, which means you water less, right? And if you are using tap water, that's water you're paying for. Yes? Who here thinks that water is expensive? How many of y'all travel internationally? If you travel internationally into other parts of the world, you will realize we are blessed with the cost of our water. We are truly blessed with the cost of our water. There are parts of the world where they have to walk about five miles a day to get five gallons of water for their entire family for that entire day. When we travel to Australia and New Zealand to speak at the International Horticultural Congress, we were, it was re-energizing for us, speaking to them. And we were talking about our water sense project, and I love telling the story. And we're talking to them about how we do our rainwater harvesting and we irrigate our landscape with the rainwater that we harvest uh, around the home. And they said, well, is this vegetable gardening? Are you, are you watering crops? And our demonstration, we don't have any at the WaterSense house at the time. And we said, no. And we said, we have a separate vegetable garden for that. And they're like, well, why are you irrigating the landscape around a house? And, they're, and we're like, well, we have to when we don't get rainfall. And they're like, well, we don't get rainfall, but we don't put irrigation systems in around the homes. And they're like, aren't you planting the right plants? There are parts of those countries, they don't have city lines running to their homes. They have to put in 10, 20,000 gallon cisterns to harvest rainwater for their dishwashers, their showers, their toilets, their drinking water, some of them even their pools. And guess what? 
they have the value on water we're not anywhere close to. And they make that water last. Do you pay attention to the gallon usage on your water bill? It only save you money the more efficient you are with that water. Remember, you are responsible for the water coming out of the pipes of your home. If you have a leak in your irrigation system, or a leaky toilet, or a leaky faucet, you can call the city all day long, but are they going to refund you that money for water they don't get back? No, you are responsible for that. Um, it also, when it comes to the uh, soil texture, compost helps. With our clay soil, it helps with drainage and also getting the nutrients to the plants. Because our clay soil is not very welcoming to water and nutrients, and it's also not very generous with water and nutrients. It holds it in, and it also doesn't let it in sometimes. If you have a sandy soil situation, it actually holds water. And there are sand belts that run through North Texas. One right runs right through the front yard of my grandmother. So if I have sand, where's the water going? Straight through. Compost will hold it for you and hold it in place. All right, here's the fun part. Compostable material. Things that you can actually compost and put back into the ground. And I'm not gonna linger on this. If you want to know more about this, you should take the composting course, all right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, August, okay. <laughs> Sign up for now. So, fruits and vegetables make sense, right? That's what you're growing. Eggshells, not egg yolks, but eggshells. Coffee grounds and the filters if you buy biodegradable filters, including tea bags if you buy the ones in biodegradable bags. Some of them actually have a poly type bag. Pay close attention to that. All right? Um, Nutshells, shredded newspaper. Cardboard. I use cardboard for sheet mulching in my landscaping. I actually put it down over things and mulch over it. If you've never looked into sheet mulching, it's amazing. I, it, when we first tested it and did it, we were amazed. We put cardboard down. With, we took the tape and the staples off, and we covered it overlapping, mulched over it, and watered it in an area we were going to plant because the clay soil was too hard for us to dig in. Within two weeks we went out there, most of the cardboard was unrecognizable. And the cardboard that wasn't, we actually had worms all growing in it. And in some parts, they had the worms coming up to that cardboard had loosened it so much, we could dig the holes by hand. It improves the quality of it. Paper, yard trimmings, and grass clippings, this is a big issue with me. When I see the yard bags out of the curb. No green leaves my property. I'm not going to fill a landfill. All right, 50% of a landfill is filled with compostable material. The other half, majority of it, could be recycled. We can make a huge impact on that. House plants, that goes for like poinsettias or Easter lilies, mums, all that stuff you buy from the holidays. Don't throw it in the trash can. It can be composted. Leaves and sawdust, sawdust that's used from unprocessed wood, wood chips. This is the fun part. Cotton and wool rags and hair and fur. 100% cotton towels. Once they're worn out and frayed on the edge, could you throw them away? Could you compost them? Cotton is from what? A plant. I've composted blue jeans before. I'm proud of that one. It takes a little longer. It takes a little longer, but I have a separate compost bin for the stuff that takes a little longer. Yes, it's cotton. That's all it is. Old jeans, and jeans that were really bad. I wasn't going to throw them in for a landfill. Fur and hair. I used to have schnauzers, and I would groom them myself. And their hair went into the compost bin. And you know what? When I put their hair, because obviously I don't really have a lot of hair in the compost bin, when I put their hair in the compost bin and used it on my vegetable garden, you know what I stopped having a problem with? Pests. My squirrels. The squirrels, they get that scent. It's a scent thing. So that's, now, there's also a lot of very, yes ma'am? Sorry, question. Huh? Yes, um, and that's in general, 
your cats and dogs, if they're using your yard, um, I'm not going to get on a rant again because I'm very passionate about this as well. Um, our water providers and municipalities, we can test water within our reservoirs and see what's draining or washing into our reservoirs. Things from the chemicals we're putting on our lawns that we shouldn't be using or we're doing too much of. But the other thing we can find is specific things that will grow and ha uh, harbor in pet waste. Pet waste is not cow manure. Here's the difference. We feed cows what? Grains. Grains. The food that we feed cats and dogs has what in it? Meat. Proteins. Just like you'll see up here, no fish and meat. Pet waste should be picked up and disposed of on a landscape, especially a vegetable garden. Their waste harbors more harmful pathogens for us than it even does them. The things you keep out of your kitchen or try to, salmonella, E. coli, things like that, is in their waste. That is one thing we want you to actually throw away. You know, I'm very diligent about this. And I just went from two very small dogs to a big dog. And, but I'm still diligent about it. And I pick up and keep it out of my yard. Um, I had a lot of questions about this last time where people say, well, how often should I pick up after my pets? Right? Hopefully after each time. Because it will start breaking down and get into our soil or wash off of our soil. But I always tell them, if you haven't done it in a while, please at least do it before your sprinklers go off or before it rains. Because then you will never pick it up and it will end up in our soil or out of our soil. If it's making, making a nice little green spot in your yard, that's not really fertilizer. That's telling you you need to fertilize. Because that means that that area is, <laughs> you're not getting enough nutrition in your landscape. Please don't leave the pet waste down. Here's a good rule of thumb for all this stuff that you shouldn't be putting in compost or your vegetable garden. Try to avoid things that have processed sugar in it or proteins like dairy, meats, things of that nature. If you can kind of follow those rule of thumb, the rest you can figure out. Paper comes from a what? Tree. Jeans come from a what comes out of the ground can go back into the ground. All right, does that help you? All right, great. All right, now the other side to that is till versus no till. This is where I'm gonna talk about sheet mulching and things like that. I am a no till. Remember I said I'm a lazy gardener and landscaper? But I'm also, I, I'm the one that, you know, works smarter, not harder. I'm a no till. This is back breaking, hard work. Who here's done this before? Who here wants to do it again? I don't think I've ever had a hand raised on that one. There are things you can do on no-till, like sheet mulching. And so what happens here on sheet mulching, and there's all different ways to do this. If you want to know detailed explanations of how everybody's done this differently, look online. But a lot of people will do straw um, and compost. Your, your cardboard acts like a weed barrier. It can help smother out weeds if you're trying to eliminate things to make room for a vegetable garden. And some people will even add the manure as they do this to condition that soil. You can put that manure on that on top of the soil and let it work its way over time. Some people will just simply put the cardboard down and put their clippings or their mulch or their compost right over the cardboard, let it get wet and break down over time. Some people have kept it wet for the first week and they said it's worked even faster as long as they kept the moisture in there. Um, we've done different tests where we let it sit for a couple of weeks or a couple of days. And the ones that we sat for a couple of days, as long as we kept it moist, it worked fast. Those microorganisms like the worms in that soil, they will work fast. So this is what sheet mulching looks like. And it's literally cardboard. We've had people go up to all the big box stores or you know, all these super stores that compress and pack all their cardboard in the back to be disposed of, hopefully recycled. They don't care. You just go in and ask, say, I need cardboard. Take as much as you want. We have no problem doing that. Now, we'll tell you, the big box stores or the electronic stores mm -hmm. have the best boxes because they have the big fridge boxes. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to cover a lot of area with one box instead of a bunch of little boxes. Now, for those of y'all who are going to be planting in the ground, mm -hmm. yes, ma'am. Um, I saw that you had a newspaper before and then cardboard boxes. You don't want anything like with the big print on it, right? No. Yeah, and that's a good question, and, and I get that a lot, and I usually point that out. 
The only thing you should be concerned about with your papers and your cardboards are staples and tape. The ink, most of our ink nowadays is all plant-based, soy-based. And so it, it, it dilutes itself and it's gone. Even adhesives, like cardboard boxes that are glued together, those, those are usually plant-based and it will break down and go away. So only all probably seen that whole road out vegetable garden. Why do you think that we do that? Access, water, all of it. It's for all of it. It also creates a mound, a very loose soil for that plant. Remember the tender plant we talked about? So as you can also see, the ridges and the furrows is what we call them. Create, and this kind of shows a way of creating a pathway in this space. But it helps with weeds, all right? You don't have competition with that vegetable plant. Holds moisture around the roots of that plant. Um, so that's why people will do the road out garden. Um, no, I had a point that I was about to make, I just forgot what it was. <laughs> so, uh, but that's what the whole road out garden is. Do you have to do the road out garden? No, remember the pictures of like the labyrinth style? You can do groupings, it doesn't necessarily, you just have to have access and try to help hold that moisture and everything into the garden. So it doesn't have to be the road out garden. I want you to think outside of that box, if you will, if that's not necessarily what you want. Aesthetically, that's not for everybody, all right? It's not for me. I'm not really a road out garden person. I'm a designer, I have to think outside the box and be really weird about things. And so I push the envelope on a lot of things. So, and then you can see here on different bedding, you can see up there where they did not do the road out garden, but here they did so that they could do walking. You have you know, the pathway for accessibility or a wider area. So your rows can be as narrow as you want them, or you can do several plants. You're not going to probably want to do three okra plants wide, because you probably will have to step in to get to those okra plants, if you know what I'm talking about with an okra plant. So, um, and you might only need one, just, you know, trust me on that one, you might only need one. When it comes to the plant spacing, there's different ways to do it. Don't overthink it. Just pay attention to the spacing of that plant. How do you know the spacing of that plant? Typically, it's going to tell you. And we'll cover that in a second. The information's on the seed packet or that plant tag. But you can see here where they put them side by side, creating a box type effect. Or they stagger them. I call it the windows, where you have a row, but then you have some plants in the spaces, right? That's giving you a, you're actually able to maximize your space more. You can fit more plants into that one than you can that one. But not everybody can focus on that one because they have OCD and everything has to be lined up. <laughs> That's okay. The whole idea is to pay attention to plant spacing so you have proper air circulation. You don't want to overcrowd or overplant because poor air circulation in your vegetable garden can encourage what? Disease and insects. Your plants start competing, you can attract fungus and other and insects go after the weaker plants. Now, this is a, a couple of pictures of how we did the vegetable gardens out at our campus. We did the road out vegetable gardens, we planned what was going to go where, and we actually went to the extreme for the OCD people <laughs> of measuring, putting a stake, and for Karen, our program assistant, she wanted to know exactly how to do the rows. And I drew a string and said, create your little ridges right there, all the way down that string. And so that's how we did it to get those perfect straight rows. Again, this is the extreme. All right? So don't overthink that we did that simply for her. And it's as simple as once we got our soil, that sheet mulching done and that compost in there, um, we did add some expanded shale. You probably saw that on my list of soil amendments. And it's in your brochure. Expanded shale is a wonderful product you might consider throughout your entire landscape. Expanded shale was developed by a and I'm not promoting it because there's lots of brands out there. What it is is it's an aggregate type stone that they cook at about 2,000 degrees. It puffs up kind of like popcorn. It holds moisture and nutrients for plants to take from. It also keeps our clay soil from packing back down. It used to be really expensive. You used to buy like a 50 pound bag for like 50 bucks. Now you can buy a 50 pound bag for about $10. So it's very reasonable. Is there, is there a certain that we can... And then that 
was a finished product. Nice straight rows. Karen was happy. And then the other part of it is we were going to grow pole beans. And we were like, well, what are we going to grow pole beans on? Well, we had these leftover bamboo stakes from some of the trees that we planted. So we stuck them on the ground and tied them on top. It was free. It was easy. And the plants loved growing up. So again, and if you want something aesthetically nice, a lot of people want to go out there and buy that metal obelisk or something to put in their landscape. To each their own. Your budget and what you're willing to do is up to you. That's where we get these trellises from is for things to grow up in. So you can get very creative out there. Now, if you're wanting to stretch the season or if you do get your vegetable garden going and we get a hard freeze, you probably want to protect your hard work, right? Yeah? So there's different simple systems you can do. Daniel did this one as an example in our vegetable garden. It turned out really well. And what he did is he put little bitty rebar stakes. You can buy little 12-inch uh, rebar. You know what rebar is? It's like what we put in concrete to hold the concrete. And he staked it in and took very thin PVC, like half-inch PVC, and arched it between them, creating these arches. And then we can run freeze cloth over it to protect it from the ice, the snow, and the colder temperatures. So it's very inexpensive. The freeze cloth was the most expensive part of the whole thing. And uh, we were able to protect things during the freeze. And they did well. Because even though a lot of our greens, our lettuces and cabbages do well in cooler temperatures, the harder freeze, the dry freeze we had recently can do a lot of damage. And a lot of people saw a lot of damage with that. Is a, uh, is a freeze irrigate them with rainwater. Tomatoes are acidic, right? Mm -hmm. So would you want to put the alkaline water or the acidic water on it? That's, that's basic, right? So take that into consideration. Drip irrigation is very popular. Uh, here's the rainwater harvesting as well. Uh, rain barrels are uh, a, a good way to get started. Uh, when I teach the rain barrel class, we call it saving from a rainy day. I call it the beginning of the addiction. For those of y'all that have the barrel, you know what I'm talking about. You see how fast it fills up, and you also see how fast you can use it. And then you're going, I need more. I need more. We teach a large tank class where we go 500 gallons or more, which sounds like a lot, but it's not. The size of the container is not as big as you think. The gallonage sounds like a lot. All right? The average bathtub is about 50, 60 gallons, just to give you an idea of the sizing. It's not like that. I have a 1,000-gallon cistern in my house, and most people don't even notice it. And it's stainless steel. So most people don't notice it. And drip irrigation, we teach you hands-on drip irrigation as well. We did a class here last year on hands-on drip. If you missed that one or if you want to catch that, you can catch that at some of our other classes. And you can run it off of your rain barrel right into your vegetable garden. Drip irrigation is the most efficient form of irrigation because what part of the plant needs the water? Do the leaves need it? There's only one correct answer on that. I don't care. I've had people come to my class who say, I like to, my plants like to be rinsed off and cooled off in the summer. No, they don't. In fact, we don't want water sitting on the leaves of the plant. That encourages disease and insect. All right? Try to keep the leaves of your plants dry and keep the, now rainwater falling on your vegetable garden is good. All right? We're referring more to like the tap water. All right. So here's a picture of inline drip. You probably recognize this from landscapes. This is that brown tubing you see everywhere. You can put this throughout your entire landscape, not just your vegetable garden. It has the emitter spaced out for you, typically 12 inches, 18 inches, and it's designed to soak, saturate the soil. Remember, what did I say about clay soil? What did I say about clay soil and water? It doesn't, it doesn't allow a lot of water in or out. So we have to introduce water slowly and drip irrigation is the best way. It's 90% efficient. Short of just not watering, it's the most efficient way for us to show you water. This one is called point source drip irrigation. This is very popular in vegetable gardens because the reason it's called point source is you actually get to punch a hole in that tube and put the emitter right where you need it, right next to that plant. And you can customize how much water comes out. You can buy emitters that put out more water or less water. 
And that's good if your okra is right next to your tomato, because your tomato is going to need a little bit more water than your okra does. So it's kind of customizing your drip irrigation. And then all these little guys, I call spaghetti tubing. And you, what we typically do in our drip is you run kind of a main line, the solid pipe down the middle, and then we're able to do little satellites off to each plant. So it's kind of customizing your vegetable garden. Now, not everybody has to do drip. Not everybody has to do a sprinkler system. Some people just want to go out there and hand water. That's the therapy of it. That's being present in that garden, right? As much as I love drip and efficiency, I harvest rainwater. And out of all my landscaping, the one thing I enjoy watering are my container plants in my vegetable garden by hand to each their own, however you want to do it, all right? Are the wheels turning? Now, the other side to it is we teach you all different ways to do drip. We teach you if you don't want to do rainwater harvesting, we teach you how to do it off your faucet. There's a whole setup that you can buy and put on your faucet. You can even attach a timer on it. If you work late or you sit here and listen to me talk for two hours and it's dark and you don't want to go home and water, you can set a timer to water. I set a timer sometimes when I go out of town to water my containers and things when I need it. So again, you don't even have to have the automatic sprinkler system to irrigate. You can do it right off the spigot off the side of your house. Sound nice? And convenient? Yes? Talk about selection. Choosing your plants. If you want to know about certain varieties, let's say you go to a garden and it just tells you, oh, that's just a celebrity tomato. Well, how, does that do well here? I, I, I don't know what that does well here. Okay, do you, should you just go ahead and buy it? No. Yeah. I mean, you got the one-year warranty. I mean, you could always just return it, right? No? Maybe do some homework. Go to a website, like the AgriLife website, all right, that gives you information. But you know what? There's this also great resource. You go in there, natural selection, you pull or create clumps and give them space and room to grow strong. You don't want to keep all of them.